Hello and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar Soft Tissue Management for Bone Augmentation. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Marius Steigman, who through his lecture today will help participants get an introduction on how to solve this soft tissue closure problem according to the location. Dr. Marius Steigman graduated in dental medicine in Neumarkt in 1987. In 2005, Dr. Steigman received his PhD summa cum laude from the University of Neumarkt. He is a diplomat of the ICOI and an educational officer of the DGOI. He has also received the medal of Semmelweis Budapest University Dental School, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. He is the founder and scientific chairman of Update Implantology Heidelberg 2002-2011 and the founder and director of the Steigman Institute. We would like to thank Botis for providing an educational grant which made this lecture possible here today. Please go ahead and use the chat box to send your comments and ask questions during the presentation and Dr. Steigman will respond to all of you at the end of the lecture. And now, without any further delay, please allow me to turn it over to the expert himself, Dr. Marius Steigman. Hello again, soft tissue management for bone augmentation. Bone augmentation has moved from the specialized clinics to our offices. Today I'm going to talk to you about soft tissue management for bone augmentation and what it means to have good flap closure to augment the bone. My institute and my office is near Heidelberg, the beautiful city, and here in the Steigman Institute we try to provide for the specialized dentist in implant dentistry different methods of soft tissue management for augmentation, for soft tissue aesthetics and also for soft tissue prosthetics which means developing emergence profiles and other way of developing the soft tissue architecture. People come to our institute for this reason till the year 2000, most of the implantologies was focused on bone. And then, over the years, we started to think twice also about the soft tissue management, not only here, but also around the world. In different parts of the world, the techniques for soft tissue augmentation is dependent on the biotype of the patient. For this reason, different techniques are applicable in for different patients depending on their tissue thickness, on the biotype of the patients and this leads us to the way how we are handling the soft tissues in different occasions. Especially for soft tissue augmentations we know that with different kinds of bone grafting materials which can be autogenous, allografts, synthetic or xenograft we can achieve uh, good bone volume for placing the implants and to overcome the biological uh, the biological behavior of these materials with the help of our flap closure. So this will be my focus today in this webinar. So soft tissue management can be achieved with surgery when we talk of bone regeneration with implant positioning for maintaining the aesthetics and provide a good maintaining of the buccal plate. And also we can have soft tissue management with the help of our prosthetics. For bone augmentation, we have different techniques to augment the bone, which are very, very well described in the literature. We have guided bone regeneration, we have block augmentation or different splitting methods of the bone. To achieve good guided bone regeneration, blocks and augmentation, the soft tissue management becomes key for the success of our surgery. When we talk about soft tissue management itself, we have different techniques to improve the quantity and the quality of the soft tissue with different flap designs like roll flap, semilunar flap, papilla, developing flaps or the aesthetic buckle flap, which are also very well documented in the literature. Implant positioning is key when we talk about the mid-facial soft tissue manipulation and papilla preservation. 
We know that the implant placed too buccally or the implant placed too close to the tooth can lead to damage of the mid-facial gingival margin to loss of papilla, which are today very important in the aesthetic implant dentistry. With the help of different prosthetic management, we can also manipulate the soft tissue for the ultimate outcome in implant dentistry today. The part of my lecture now will lead us or will be focused on the soft tissue management for bone augmentation in surgery for guided bone regeneration, blocks and splitting. Soft tissue man management means incision, flap design and suturing. For this we have to choose the right membranes, the correct bone graft material or we can have different materials to improve soft tissue quantity and quality like mucoderm, bone graft like cerabone or other materials. The right choice of incision flap design and suturing leads to the ultimate outcome. Also, the choice of our materials is very, very important. So what we did in the last couple of years in our way to do surgery is that we choose the techniques for surgery for the soft tissue manipulation in connecting with bone graft, biotype dependent. It means that in patients with a thick biotype, we do a different kind of surgery than in a patients with thin biotype. And this is according to the location of our surgery. We do, for thick biotype, different incision flap design and suture if our surgery will be in the anterior mandible, in the posterior mandible, especially in the anterior maxilla when also aesthetic is needed but also in the posterior maxilla. After we described our flap design, the way we are handling the tissue is also key for the success of our bone graft. We can prepare the flap with a full mucoperiosteal flap when we need small bone augmentation. We can achieve elasticity of the soft tissue with the help of a periosteal slit in patients with thick biotype and with a white flap, or sometimes to improve the elasticity of the tissue, we have to use split thickness flaps, or what we call DMP. It's a detachment of the mucosal attachment from the periosteum with the help of special instruments like the split tissue instruments. So you, I will share with you some of the techniques which are really biotype dependent. So surgery in thin biotype is the one which leads us to a lot of failures like flap necrosis, flap dehiscence, swelling and hematoma. So in thin biotype, gaining flap elasticity for grafting is depending on the way we are doing the surgery and how we are handling the tissues, what kind of instruments we are using. We want to avoid flap tearing and dehiscence, but also we want to avoid late complications. So we want to avoid swelling and hematoma. For this, the solution is in the mandible, the stipod technique, which means the mucosal detachment of the mucosa from the underlying periosteum and the maxilla where we want to achieve big bone grafting procedures or when we want to achieve a high volume of augmentation, we can use the palatal sliding flap. So let's go to the posterior mandible where to have a good soft tissue closure of, over our augmentation, which could be blocks or GBR, in our case, especially GBR, in thick biotype, the procedure which leads us to a good success is a split thickness flap or a mucosal detachment. In the posterior maxilla, we have to avoid any flap manipulation of the buccal flap and bring the soft tissue from the palate with the help of a palatal sliding flap. The details of the procedures in the posterior mandible 
I will explain you during the lecture. Bone augmentation is necessary because after extraction of the tooth, we know that we have different kind of bone resorption patterns, which can lead to a horizontal resorption of the bone in the first phase, and after that, to a vertical resorption of the bone. Today we know that also this will lead to an aesthetic change of the patients. So we have to analyze the patient from aesthetically point of view, the face, then the bone, and then also the soft tissue. Today, horizontal augmentation is very predictable, but also in the last couple of years, vertical bone augmentation has become more predictable than it used to be in the past. We can see that Sometimes, or most of the times, when we have bone resorption, also we have a thin tissue. So it's very difficult to cover big volume of bone added with the help of thin tissue. So we have to prepare the soft tissue in such a way that we can cover the augmentation, gain elasticity for coverage, distribute the force on a big surface of the soft tissue to gain primary closure and also at the same time to avoid late flap opening after primary closure. So we want in cases like this to get a big elasticity of the flap to cover our bone graft, to choose the right material in the left picture, you can see we use a mixture of autogenous bone and cerebone, achieve primary closure and avoid late complications like flap opening, dehiscence or even flap necrosis. So what we really want is in patients with thin bone and thin tissue to be able to widen the bone or to have a vertical augmentation to place our implants. For this, we can have simultaneous bone grafting with implants and GBR, or we can have stage procedures, like we can see in this picture, where first we're gonna have bone augmentation, where we can augment the bone from two or one or two millimeters to 10 to 12 millimeters, and then in a different procedures, we can place our implants and we want to achieve also integration and prevent biological changes in time. This can be different by the quality of the bone. And this is depending about the amount of xenograft we are using. In this specific case, you can see the borderline between the autogenous or the host bone and depending on the mixture, the amount of bone which is growing around the particles of cera bone, which gives us good stability of the implant, a good healthy vascularized tissue for the future also integration, but also in this combination we can prevent future resorption of the buccal plate and we can maintain and work against the biological changes which could be by using another material with a big potential of resorption. Here you can see that today with the help of GBR and mostly with the help of soft tissue techniques we can achieve high volume of bone augmentation comparing the two pictures in the left side of the screen compared to the right side of the screen with the help of guided bone regeneration and soft tissue management to get soft tissue closure. It can be also uh, avoided, can be also avoided hip grafts or chin grafts intraorally and we can graft this kind of resorbed maxilla with the help of guided bone regeneration and the right soft tissue adjuvant procedures. 
So you can see that during the time with primary closure, the amount of bone augmentation can be improved over time in simultaneous or in stage procedures. With the help of cone beam CT today, we can appreciate the volume of augmentation which is achievable today. We can see in this CBCT scans or slides, cross-section slides, how the density of the bone can be seen and the amount of bone we can use for placing our implants and restoring the volume or the contours which are needed for our implants. However, in all these procedures, the most important thing is to be able to close the flap and maintain it with different flap designs, different flap manipulation and different sutures. Depending on the materials which can be used today, we can place the implants simultaneously if the implant is in the right three-dimensional position and then with the help of bone grafting material or combining autogenous bone and different bone augmentation material, we can come to a very good result. So let's go and talk a little bit about what is needed today for a good bone augmentation. Today, it's not only that we can achieve good bone volume, but we want to have a flap which is tension-free, scarless, with a good quality of bone and soft tissue, a good quantity of bone and soft tissue, also a good color, and we want to avoid recession around implants by using the right bone grafting material and the correct soft tissue procedures. We can plan the amount of bone augmentation with the help of three-dimensional planning, with the help of CBCT, radio In this example, we can see that we have a very big resorption of bone after a traumatic injury many years ago. And the amount of augmentation is not only horizontally, but also vertically. For this, we have to prepare the soft tissue in the beginning to be able to cover such big augmentation. We can see here for this specific patient how we can move for a knife edge bone to a high volume of bone in the horizontal dimension with the help of a combination of autogenous bone and cerabone xenograft material. The volume of bone is enough to place not only normal diameter implants, but also wide diameter implants for a long term. This is due to the fact that we are changing the way we are doing our flap design for augmentation in this case. A flap design can be made for access, just to open a flap and place our implants. For augmentation in GBR, which needs a different kind of soft tissue manipulation, we can have a flap design for increasing the keratinized gingiva, a flap design for improving the aesthetics, or sometimes we can use flapless surgery just to place our implants where bone augmentation is not needed. So what's the common complication we have today? And why is soft tissue management of such importance? We can see that if we don't have the appropriate flap design, we can expect different kinds of complication when we are talking about bone grafting. And this is independent of the materials we are using. The common complication would be flap opening with loss or infection of our augmentation material. It can be dehiscence, which also leads to loss of our augmentation. It can be flap necrosis, if we overcome the tension in the flap with our sutures. But also, it can be late complications, which also lead to flap opening, dehiscence and necrosis, when 
After the injury of the surgery, we have swelling and hematoma. So we know in the literature that the most, com co uh, most common cause of infection when is membrane exposure. In the past, when we didn't use collagen membranes, or even with collagen membranes, when no membrane exposure occurred, we had 96.6% .6 of regeneration. When we had membrane exposure, the degree of regeneration dropped to less than half, so 41.6%. Sometimes we have the impression that the bone graft occurred, but we will have fibrous tissue versus bone, and we will have higher residual defects. When instead of bone, we will have fibrous tissue in growth due to the fact that the membrane would resorb too fast, but would we have an exposure? This could lead to a future complication like peri-implantitis. This problem occurs also because during the bone grafting procedure, but by not having the right approach for the soft tissue management, we could see that when we have the grafted sites, always the tissue is thinner, and by being thinner, and we try to overcome tension, we can have a flap dehiscency and flap opening. In this study by Nisaela, we can see that the grafted group showed the loss of tissue thickness of 0.1 millimeter. And this leads also to complications. Sadi described very nicely which are the high-risk patients for in different situations. Patients with systematic disease, which had wound contamination and subsequent infection, are very prone to flap dehiscence. Also, if the mucosa is damaged by denture and stomatitis or different kind of radiation before surgery, if implants are placed in the region subjected to the previous surgery and the implants perforate the soft tissue, this also can lead to complications. If there is insufficient keratinized gingiva or we have a frenulum attachment to the upper portion of the alveolar ridge, we can also have the hissing flap opening. Improper closure, which means that we don't apply the right suturing technique. Improper design of the incision line has shown to be also key. We can have our bone grafting with the help of a crestal incision or with the help of a buccal incision. This is depending on the technique we are using. If the flap is not sufficiently undermined, like we mentioned before, there is a big difference in achievement of flap elasticity if we are having a full mucoperiosteal flap if we apply a periosteal slit or if we are using a split thickness flap. Immediate grafting in the posterior region after extraction means that we are trying to move the mucogingival junction from palate to lingual, from buccal, excuse me, from buccal to lingual, and in this way we are covering our grafting material with mucosa instead of keratinized gingiva. Then the use of improper bone grafting material. We can have bone grafting material which perforate the flaps or using the improper membrane. Overloading with the provision of denture can also lead to the hissence and smoking in the time of the healing is also contraindicated. So what has changed in the soft tissue management is that today we have to understand the soft tissue response to injury applied by us. It means injury applied by the dentist during our surgery. Incision, flap preparation and suture influence the success. And we know today that different biotypes react different and heal different. So the key for success in guided bone regeneration or in augmentation with the help of zocto splitting is called the PASS principle. The PASS principle helps us achieve success. So for this, we have to have primary wound closure, which is the soft tissue management, 
we did angiogenesis, which means that we need the correct blood supply and vascular ingrowth for our bone graft. We need to maintain space, so the bone grafting material has to be stable, has to be vascularly ingrowth. We have to use the correct membranes, tenting screw, and all this augmentation material has to be stable for a while so we can achieve the right results. For this, we developed a different technique like the stipo. You can see here a case, a result six months after guided bone regeneration with different kind of soft tissue management where we can grow the bone from one to 10 to 12 millimeters. And this will be the recipient site for implants in the future. Another example, when we are using guided bone regeneration and different material with the help of um, adjacent membrane and serra bone in combination with autologous bone, we, we, where we could not only build the bone horizontally, but also achieve some slight vertical augmentation, which can be maintained over time. So, these kind of procedures are due to the fact that we are applying different kind of flap management, which I will describe to you in the next couple of minutes. So, when we go back, now we will concentrate on the soft tissue management with surgery for bone augmentation when we are placing blocks or when we want to split the bone or when we apply guided bone regeneration. So the flat design and the, and the incision is so important. We know in the literature that we can cover a bone graft with a full thickness flap or with a partial thickness flap. Both flaps have advantages and disadvantages. We know that the disadvantage of a partial thickness flap is a lot of bleeding and also a partial thickness flap has the disadvantage of a huge postoperative swelling, which is not the case in a full thickness flap. That means that in a partial thickness flap, we can achieve a better coverage of our volume of bone, but also we have late complications due to the post-operative post swelling and bleeding. So the factors which influence the incision when we make a flap is the anatomical factor first, which is the periodontal biotype of the patient. Then the surgical experience. So we have to be able to cover the bone graft material we are placing. Other anatomical factors are the thickness or the presence of the buccal plate, especially in patients which lost or lose their teeth due to trauma or endodontic complications as seen in the X-ray nearby. Then the right flat design to cover our augmentation. And one of the most important things today is the interproximal height of bone when patients lose their teeth due to periodontal disease. So, let's talk a little bit about the flap design, which is so important to achieve good result and to maintain flap closures. Flap position is very important. We know today that we make our flaps and stay in a concavity. We don't do our incision anymore over bony convexities. The flap flap outline, if we position our incision in the sulcus or we can position our incision in the gingival margin. The purpose of the flap is so important. If we do it just for bone graft, if we do it for small volume augmentation, which kind of instrumentation and which are the materials we are using. So the flap outline can be a uh, Flapless surgery can be a papilla preservation flap, can be a circular flap, can be a triangular flap, a trapezoidal flap, a rectangular flap, 
or aesthetic buffer flap. The flap design is really important if we only want to graft like the posterior maxilla or the posterior mandible, or if you really want to maintain or improve the aesthetic zone. So this flap design is dependent on the location of our grafting and also about the aesthetic demands of the patients. We can prevent future soft tissue complication and sometimes we can use the right flap design to repair if there is any complication in our augmentation. So the flap design is also dependent on the purpose. If we just place an implant, the flap is going to be a full mucoperiosteal flap. But if we want to do bone grafting, then we have more options. One option is a periosteal slit, split thickness flap or mucosal detachment. And if we want to maintain the aesthetic soft tissue outcome, then our flap design will try to prevent future recession of the soft tissue or loss of the interproximal papillae. Or we can have aesthetic correction if we have recession around implants or previous papilla loss. And also the used materials dictates or decides which materials to use, which kind of a flat design to make according to the used materials. With a resorbable membrane, we can go for a crystal approach for a non-resorbable membranes, for example, uh, some authors recommend to have a buccal approach. So our flap design is not only dependent on the biotype of the patient, on the procedure, but also on the materials we are using. So you can see that for the flap preparation, depending on the amount of volume we want to augment, we're going to manipulate the soft tissue and prepare the flap in addition to the flap design with mucoperiosteal flap, a periosteal slit for small volume or a split thickness flap for a big volume augmentation. In the posterior maxilla, we use the mucosal detachment. This is dependent on the periodontal biotype. In a patient with a thin biotype, we will choose a periosteal flap and try to avoid the split thickness flap to avoid necrosis. Then the tissue thickness is also a determinant factor which kind of flap preparation we're going to use. But more than everything, it's the graft size. If we need a high volume augmentation, then the split thickness flap or the mucosal detachment is so determined. We can see that according to the used material, our flap position in out and outline will be with a different approach. In a picture near, you can see on your screens, you can see now that we have a split thickness flap, but with a crystal incision. And in this case is the material which we will use will be xenogen material and a resolvable membrane. So let's go and see which are the most important factors which we need. So, flat necrosis, dehiscence, and tearing are the most common complication. So, we need some basic principles of flap design to prevent these complications, which are different than in regular surgery, because we know for volume augmentation, we have to stretch the tissues and to prepare them in such a way that we can cover our grafts. So, we need tension-free, scarless, enough quantity and quality of soft tissue, a good color and no recession. And we will go and talk a little bit about mostly of the flap design and of the flap preparation in conjunction with the membranes, the bone graft and the quantity of soft tissue. Okay, so let me give you an example. In the posterior mandible, when we have a thick biotype, a split thickness flap is the procedure which is preferable. And if we have this uh, thick biotype, we can split the flap starting from the mucogingival junction. This is an example from the beginning of the 90s where we used to use 
different kind of procedure, but the procedures from this time we can use also today. What you can see in patients with a good height of bone, but a very narrow ridge, we need only horizontal bone augmentation. So in these cases, we can use a space maintaining device, have a combination of allograft with cerabone, with xenograft, and the flap is splitted from the mucogingival junction, and this will give us enough soft tissue to cover. It's very important the way we are doing the splitting procedures. From the mucogingival junction, we can split the flap with the help of a blade, with the help of a scissor, and with the help of special tissue splitting instruments. After placing these materials, we can see that we can achieve very good primary closure and the soft tissue comes back in the initial position by the way it's prepared. And in this way, we can achieve very good white bone, which looks like natural bone, but it's an ingrowth of xenograft, the kind of cerebone, and we can place very good uh, diameter implant, and this kind of procedure can be maintained in time. So, another example with a resorbable procedure and simultaneous placement. In this case, we are using porcine pericardial membrane, and we can place the implants and do the guided bone regeneration simultaneously. Implants are placed, it's necessary to achieve good primer stability, and then as you can see in the right picture, the periosteum is attached on the bone, the soft tissue is detached, and with the help of scissors, we can gain soft tissue elasticity to cover our graft. Here, a combination of material is necessary. Usually, we cover our implants, the surface of the implants, with autogenous bone, which is harvested from the region. If we don't have enough, we can harvest the tissue from another donor site. And then after we make this sandwich bone augmentation described by uh, Juan, Mish and Eva, we can place xenograft, which will maintain the contour and the volumes of the ridge over time and can work against natural biological changes. Then the membrane is applied first and pinned usually above the alveolar nerve or can be placed under the periosteum. Then the grafting material is added and then we can close the flap very nicely. The middle picture after anesthesia, you can see the uh, amount of bone which is achieved, and on the right picture we can observe the amount of bone which grew not only in the width, but also is covering the implants. Many years after, when we had to place implants, four or five years after, on the right side, we can now observe the amount of bone, and the color is white due to the fact that we have a combination of xenograft uh, together with the autogenous bone. Over time, we improved these techniques. For small augmentation, we are using a periosteal slit, especially in patients with a thick biotype. And when we need a high volume augmentation, we will do a split thickness flap from the level of the mucogingival junction with specially developed instrument like the Steigman tissue splitters to, di to distribute the force on a big surface and to avoid the late complications. So, for small augmentation, let me walk you through it very fast. We need a periosteal slit. In the posterior mandible, when we have a thick biotype, uh, but even in thin biotype, we are using a split thickness flap. We know that the periosteal slit these days can give us up to 150% increase 
of the soft tissue. So for high volume augmentation, a periosteal slit is not enough. This study by Park et al. in 2012 showed that one vertical incision can increase uh, one millimeter of soft tissue. The second vertical incision, another millimeter or almost another millimeter, but the correct periosteal slit or the periosteal scoring can add mostly of the soft tissue elasticity. But the periosteal slit can only be as good as the, how we make it. So first it's a full mucoperiosteal flap and then the periosteal slit must connect the vertical releasing incision. Here is an example. This is a picture where we demonstrate a correct periosteal slit for small volume augmentation. So, when we want to advance flaps over blocks or high volume augmentation, the periosteal slit in our office is not the uh, technique of choice. You can see here a complication of a soft tissue dehiscence with perforation of the soft tissue because we are transforming thick tissue in thin tissue and after stretching this tissue, we apply a periosteal slit in the wrong position. So what we are doing today, we can stretch the tissues with different procedures. Here is an example of guided bone regeneration with the attempt to graft the bone with a periosteal slit, which we see that in patients with thin, thin biotype will lead to a rupture of the tissues. So we can observe now, after the suturing, that if we want to suture, or if the patient will have swelling or hematoma, the tissues will tear, which is very nice, which very nicely can be observed in this movie. So for big augmentations, for blocks, rings, or other procedures, a split thickness flap is the procedure which should be applied. But not only the split thickness flap per se, but also the way we are doing it. So for high volume augmentation, we are doing something which I described, the stipod, which is a versatile buckle flap, which several steps in which we can achieve a lot of elasticity to cover high volume augmentations. An example for that is seen on the right picture. So where bone is added, we're going to perform a mucoperiosteal flap and where there is no implant or no bone regeneration takes place, we're going to perform a split thickness flap in different ways. So the philosophy behind it is to gain elasticity for tension-free closure in thin tissue is that a small surface of exposed mucosa after periosteal slit is very prone to tearing, which we saw demonstrated in the movie before. However, the key is that dividing the force on a bigger surface of mucosa with the help of a split thickness flap reduces the probability of tearing. The disadvantage is that the regular split thickness flap is increasing bleeding and swelling, which can lead to future complications like flap open. Why the bleeding and swelling? Because we know that by when we apply a blade or scissors to split the flap, we are destroying the supraperiosteal blood vessels, which lead to uh, hematoma and to swelling. For this, we want to maintain all these vessels in the mucosa after detaching the mucosa from the underlying periosteum. For this, we develop special instruments with the help of which we can now split the tissues very nicely and maintaining the blood supply in the mucosa, stretching the tissue and in this way, we are able, even in patients with thin biotype, to cover big augmentations. 
A similar procedure we published in 2012 in International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry. And in these pictures from the article, we can see that by using the periosteum as a pocket flap for bone regeneration and by detaching the mucosal insertion from the underlying periosteum, we can achieve very good volume of bone augmentation. We can go, like in this case, from 1 millimeter to 10 or 12 millimeter with the use of a membrane like the adjacent membrane. We can increase the thickness of the soft tissue with mucoderm. But here, a combination of autogenous bone and cerebone leads to very good results. When we look at this animation, you can see that by starting our detachment of the mucosal insertion from the underlying periosteum, we are able to close the flap primarily, distribute the forces on a brick flap area. In this way, the soft tissue is not damaged, and then we can achieve very good results. What you can see in this video is in patients with very thin bone, sometimes there is also very thin soft tissue. And this soft tissue and thin mucosa is very prone to rupture, not only during the surgery, but also after the surgery. So when we look in this case, we can apply the stipot technique very easily. So what we want is that with one incision in the keratinized gingiva, we will have a mucoperiosteal flap to the mucogingival junction, and then we can use our splitting instruments to detach the mucosal insertion from the underlying periosteum in a very predictable way. So, what we see in the left picture is that without any vertical incisions, we are able to detach the mucosal attachment from the underlying periosteum and in this way to get very good results. So after having the splitness of the tissue, you go back, you can see that the periosteum is detached with the help of the split thickness instruments. And although the tissue is very thin, we are able to stretch the tissue and pull it over our grafted site. Even if we apply a lot of force, this tissue will not break. We have a lot of tissue and this tissue will not only cover the grafts, in this case we are placing implants uh, and doing the guided bone regeneration in the same time, but also will avoid any future complication. So you can see after placing our implants, in the right position, we can then go ahead and do some intra bony marrow penetration and then apply our membrane like the adjacent membrane. And then, after application of the membrane, we can add a lot of grafting material. Our goal is here to move from 1.5 millimeter of bone to 10 or 12 millimeters of bone. But this is only possible with the right amount and the right manipulation of tissue. Especially in patients with very thin biotype, the handling of the tissues, all buccally but also lingually, are very important. We want to avoid any slipping of the bone grafting material below the lingual flap. This could lead to complications. So what you can see here that this membrane is very nicely adaptable and after placing more layers of the membrane, we can close now the flap in thin biotype patients in a very predictable manner without having any other incisions. So you see here is where we started and then in Traboni Mano penetration. Now, with the help of a special suturing technique, after the detachment of the mucosal insertion from the underlying periosteum, we can come with very good results. 
So then we have a multiple layer of suturing and we can close our flap very nicely. So again, in pictures, you can see our procedure without any vertical incision in a patient with very thin biotype by distributing the force on a bigger surface, we can then graft high volume and then close the flap in a very predictable manner. Now, when we analyze after six months, you can see that we place the implant simultaneously with the grafting and we can observe the border of the old bone, old hose bone, and the amount of bone we added with the guided bone regeneration procedure. Here we have some scattering, and we can then see these are um, tapered implants, tapered internal implants. We can see where we placed the pins and how this case develops from a patient of Asian descendant with a very thin biotype, and then we can apply after improving the amount of keratinized gingiva, we can improve the quality of the keratinized gingiva and we have a very good uh, aesthetic result. Now, in the posterior maxilla, when we have extractions and very thin biotype, let me share with you these kind of procedures. We bring the soft tissue from the palate with the help of a palatal sliding flap. You see that in this case, we will have an extraction. We will perform a close sinus elevation, which we are doing in this case. But still, the most important thing will be the soft tissue coverage. And I will show you, this is the applications of the implant. And now the key will be how to bring the soft tissue. So you can see now that after placing implants, the most important thing in patients with a thin biotype is how to bring the soft tissue from the palate. And in this case, we are using no manipulation of the soft tissue on the buccal side, but we are bringing the soft tissue with the procedure described by Carlo Tinti in the 90s uh, with the palatal sliding flap. For this, we are using, again, the splitting instruments, the splitting instruments, which will, okay, now you can see how we are bringing the soft tissue from the palate by using the splitting instruments. We perform a split thickness flap at the palate at a different level. And when this kind of a flap design, we are bringing the soft tissues from the palate to the buccal. Here you can see the healing pattern when we remove the sutures. So no manipulation on the buccal aspect of the maxilla, especially in patients with thin biotype. For this, we are closing the extraction socket or bone graft from the palate. And we are moving the tissues with the help of a palatal sliding flap towards the buccal. After a week, this suture stays closed. There is no dehiscence and no fenestrations, although we had to do guided bone regeneration. And then the healing will appear very nicely. So as a consequence, especially in patients with a thin biotype, we want to avoid any manipulation of the tissues from the buccal aspect and we will bring the tissues from the palatal side. And then we will achieve a very nice result, although the patient will have some scars at the palatal side. In thin biotype, which is different, uh, in the posterior maxilla, we can achieve big bone augmentation. On the buccal aspect, we will perform a full mucoperiosteal flap, but we will avoid manipulation of the tissue at the buccal aspect and add soft tissue from the palatal aspect, again, with the help of a palatal slide, like in a case like this, which I will share with you very briefly in the next two, three minutes. 
So in a case like this, when we have very thin bone and we have to build up the bone buccally, we can go ahead and use the same technique with no manipulation of the soft tissue in the buccal aspect, but we will split the tissues with the mucosal detachment. You can observe very thin bone in the beginning. You can see now the splitting instruments in action. And after exposing the thin bone, we will place our membrane and apply a lot of bone grafting material. For this reason, we need to separate the flaps, uh, the mucosa from a mucogingival junction with the help of the mucosal detachment. You can see here on the right side of the maxilla, a very thin knife edge bone, and then we separate the mucosa from the periosteum, we observe no bleeding, and then we will add a lot of uh, serra bone and autogenous bone and cover everything with adjacent membrane. We do uh, multiple sutures. First suture will be sutured with the periosteum and the second layer will be sutured with the mucosa. And in this way, we can achieve very high stability of the augmentation material. The same is done on the right side where we are using the same membrane. We can observe how thin the tissue is. Then we apply again a lot of grafting material and we are widening again in the maxilla with the same technique of detachment of the mucosa from the underlying periosteum we can achieve a very, very nice result. In addition to that, we are using some Jason fleece to cover our manipulation. Sometimes, due to the manipulation, we have complications, like in this case, you can see that we have some necrotic tissue, which is then sutured after, but it stays stable and it's covering our membrane. So you can see at the time of uncovering, the combi CTs reveals a huge amount of bone augmentation. And when we open, we can see now that we moved from one millimeter of, even in the maxilla, from one millimeter of bone to 12 millimeters of bone. And now we can apply our implants in a very successful manner. Over all these times, the patients have to wear a denture, and this is made in such a way that it stays stable on the palate and avoids any pressure on the grafting. However, cerebone material is very, very stable and can also hold against tension or pressure. That was on the left side. Here you can see the amount of bone we build on the right side. And then with the help of removable galvanoform technique, we can achieve very predictable result in a patient where we could graft with the help of particulate material only and the correct soft tissue management, we can achieve very good results. So when we want to think about soft tissue management, we can have different kinds of approaches. This is dependent on the biotype. And in these hours, I could just share with you very little procedures, but one or two procedures, which are the main techniques we are using in our institute to have very good predictable results. Thank you very much, and I will be very pleased to answer your questions. So one question is, uh, are you leaving the mucogingival junction attached to the periosteum? No, no. The, yes, the first part is a full mucoperiosteal uh, flap at the level of the mucogingival junction and only from the mucogingival junction we are detaching the mucosa from the underlying periosteum. One question is, do I use PRF membranes for covering augmentation? No, I um, usually I try to close it with uh, my flap, but you can 
add uh, for a better soft tissue healing some PRF. The, what kind of membrane do I use? The membrane I use is depending on the amount of augmentation I want. If I have a small volume to medium volume augmentation, I use adjacent membrane. But if I use a high degree of augmentation, I prefer sometimes a collagen cross-linked membrane. What kind of suturing material is one question when you do layer technique. I usually use uh, Supramid, but also I use some EPFTA suturing material like Coreflon or others. Question is, do I also detach the periosteum from the bone? Yes, when I want to use the periosteum as a container for my graft augmentation material, then I detach the periosteum from the bone and use it as a container or sometimes you can even remove part of it and place an embrane, membrane. One question is, do I use titanium membrane? No, I use titanium membrane or titanium reinforced membrane only when I my goal is for vertical augmentation. For horizontal augmentation, a collagen membrane will do. Another question is, how does swelling compare with this technique versus traditional periosteal release? Uh, the swelling, if you are using a split thickness flap, the swelling is much bigger than a usual periosteal release. However, you gain more elasticity. And, um, but if you try to detach the mucosal insertion in a specific manner, then the swelling is comparable with the uh, split thickness or with the periosteal, sorry, with the periosteal release. Another question is, do you make additional cuts Cats, cut, cat, uh, cuts for the periosteum for releasing. No, the, no additional cuts in the periosteum. Question, do you use tenting screws? Tenting screws are used for vertical bone augmentation. For horizontal bone augmentation, uh, I don't use tenting screws. Question from Ludwig Harrison, are you using two or three layer suture? I use two layer suture. Another question, do you always mix cerebrin with autogenous bone? Yes, I, most of the time. It depends if I do staged approach, I will always mix it. If I do simultaneous approach where I place the implant and the GBR takes place at the same time, I'm doing a sandwich bone augmentation technique which means that I'm going to cover my implant first with autogenous bone and then the outer layer is going to be cerebone. Question is, what do you think about periosteal releasing incision and lingual aspect? Periosteal releasing incision and lingual aspect can be done, but you have to be very, very careful. There are other techniques which show how you can separate the outer layer from the insertion of the musculus mylohyoideus and it, that gives you much more releasing incision if you need it uh, or other surgeons just remove the insertion of the musculus mylohyoideus okay can you show one more palatal split flap next time in the next webinar. Okay, are you using fibrin glue to get a more stable graft? No, I never use fibrin glue. I usually just make my suturing techniques. How long do I wait? Another question, how long do you wait after this procedure before placing implants? In high volume augmentation, the rule of thumb is to have one millimeter per month. 
so we wait a long time. When we graft six to nine millimeters, we wait uh, nine months. And if we go up to 12 millimeters, we also wait uh, nine months. Uh, the rule of thumb is one millimeter a month. Another question is, when you detach mucosa from the periosteum at the mucogingival junction, how far from the mucogingival junction do you place a membrane or do you fix the membrane on the periosteum? Uh, I fix the membrane in the depth of the vestibulum depending on the length of the implant I want to place. And I fix the membrane under the periosteum, never fix the membrane on the periosteum. Another question is, on the last case presentation, it appeared you were performing split tissue flap on the palatal where you're getting, where you're getting release of the palatal tissue. Yes, this is a very good technique uh, to get coverage on the crest with the help of tissue from the palate. It's a split flap in different layers, like I mentioned in the lecture described by Timothy. Uh, so you can have one incision and the, another incision and different layers so you can move the tissue from the palate to the buccal. Another question is, is it easy to split the flap? Is it always possible? Uh, it's not so easy, you need a learning curve. It's not always possible if the tissue is too thin you pre prefer to bring the tissue from another position. Another question, are you using split crest technique? No, uh, or I use it very seldomly only when we have a certain amount of spodiosa between the cortical plates. Question, dear Marius, do you applicate mucordem simultaneously with implants? And if yes, could you shortly describe the technique? Yes, I apply mucoderm simultaneously with the implants, especially in patients with a thin biotype. And if initially the soft tissue thickness is less than two millimeters, I just apply the mucoderm on the crest and then suture on top of it. I don't suture with it. I see that the questions stopped. So I think we are done. Thank you very much for attending the webinar and it's been a great pleasure to share this hour with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Steigman, for sharing your lecture and your insightful information with us. We would also like to thank Bautis for making this online course possible and thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You will receive an email notification with a link to the recording. Further questions regarding the lecture today may be submitted directly on the website on the courses page under the Ask the Expert tab. So please go ahead and submit your questions and Dr. Spikeman will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Please be sure to visit Botis Academy Focus Educational Platform www.botisacademy.com and keep an eye out for our growing schedule of online courses. Thank you again to all, take care and goodbye.